a lot of developers are they don't work the nine to five like you and I may. They may work off hours. They want to be self-sufficient. So documentation is going to be key for them, along with the functionality, security, portability. So all of these considerations. And, and this goes back to, you know, who is driving the requirements? It was the merchants. It was, you know, using ISVs, for example. Now it's consumers using applications and interfaces. And to make that easier, we need to make it easier for developers as well. And that includes the documentation uh, and how we can, you know, review that, interpret it, and um, be self-sufficient. Hello, Timmy Napso here with the Embedded Podcast here at Fortis. Today, we have the Senior Director of Product Strategy from the Straw Hacker Group, TSG. Josh Istis oversees the strategic direction of TSG's acquiring industry metrics, also known as AIM, global experience monitoring, GEM, e-report products, and strategic partnerships. Josh is an avid golfer. We're going to talk a little bit about that, Josh, as you can see behind me with the, all the golf balls. <laughs> Fantasy sports enthusiast, aka the office commissioner, and a big fan of Kansas Jayhawk basketball Josh lives for the intersection of sports and analytics. Josh, welcome to Embedded. Thanks a lot for the time today. Thank you, Timmy. Happy to be here. Yeah, let's let's uh let's talk a little bit really quickly before we get into TSG and the work stuff. I'm always loving to talk about golf. Uh, so, um, you know, whenever somebody says they're a golfer, I love to ask the first question: What is the index, the gin, the gam, uh, the the handicap? Where, where, where are you playing there uh, as, as a golfer? Oh, I am the definition of your average golfer. I'm right at a 16, 17 gin index. So, you know, you can invite me out to a course. I'm probably not going to beat you, but we're going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. well, you know, the running joke for me, actually, a lot of people ask me, it was particularly one of my really good friends. That's like a seven or eight. He's always been a really good golfer. And I not naturally didn't come out of the, the, the golf stable, if you will, playing really well as a soccer player, broke my ankle and decided, you know, I had a daughter already at that point. I was in physical therapy. I couldn't get to work. I was like, I need to pick a sport I can get better at every year, not mm -hmm. worse. And it was getting really kind of depressing trying to run with a lot of these soccer players at the time and thinking I could make moves that I couldn't. So I took on golf and I was aggressive in coaching. But like right away, I was a 30. You know, some people go right to 22 or 23 mm -hmm. or they start off as their baseline. I was like 40. Like I was embarrassing but the thing that they all said about me is when you saw me on the course it looked like i knew what i was doing like the gear was top notch <laughs> you know i'm looking like like i've been playing since i was five years old uh and then you know you see the first swing and it was such a disaster so i got coached uh worked quite a bit i ended up here now at a at an 11 which you know i'm right there just a few years Very ago nice. two years ago actually i was i was right there around the 15 so goal this year 2024 hit single digit um big goal see if i can uh if i can accomplish that which would, which would be great um with that being said any favorite courses what part of the country are you in uh i'm calling out of omaha nebraska which is okay. where tsg is headquartered so actually i'm in a, a monday night golf league at one of our, our muni courses here which is a lot of fun. And I actually was the commissioner of that league until I was kind of able to hand that off. But uh, that's where we regular, regularly play. Um, one of my colleagues here is also on the team and we have a lot of fun every Monday night. Nice, nice. And then a love and passion for fantasy uh, sports. Is it specifically football or is it anything fantasy? You know, I have dabbled in probably just about every sport, including, you know, obviously football, basketball, hockey, baseball, golf. <laughs> I've never got into like the NASCAR, but uh, yeah, usually football. But, um, you know, that only lasts for so many months throughout the year. So right. you got to pick up something else to enjoy. Yep. Yep, exactly. I got really into like survivor pools in football. Not fan. I did yeah. fantasy. And the time commitment was tremendous and I would miss, you know, trade cutoffs and things like that. And I was like, oh, if somebody gets injured and your entire season was relying on that one player. And then 
I couldn't handle the mental strain. So I went to survivor pools instead, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Yeah. I, I really enjoy it. You know, I kind of brought the – originated the league here at TSG, if you will. I do my weekly emails to make sure everybody's entertained and engaged throughout the season, especially when we're getting here to the later seasons where some teams start to give up. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. TSG in, in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, located there. Um, tell me a little bit about TSG, uh, the Straw Hacker Group, what they do, um, and some of those products, you know, AIM, GEM. Um, I've, I've seen them in action. Uh, really mm -hmm. cool. If you can highlight some of that, that'd be great. Yeah, TSG uh, is a market intelligence, analytics, and consulting firm. Started in 2006. It's really just a pure... A consulting firm, but as we grew, we re, you know realized the the need and the benefits of products that we developed, and so we have a market intelligence team. They're really the eyes and the ears of the payment space. They do a lot of work uh, with surveys as well as thought leadership and helping our clients with their custom uh, needs, whatever you know, whatever they come to us for. We also have our analytics products that you referenced there. Uh, which one would be AIM, our acquiring industry metrics platform. And that was actually you know, where I started here at TSG as a, as a data scientist. And, and I grew up to a, a senior director of product strategy, but really focusing on our acquiring industry metrics uh, product initially, which is our financial and uh, profitability performance benchmarking service, uh, where we're actually able to benchmark merchant, merchant acquiring portfolios against the, the rest of the industry in an anonymized way. So it's a really cool tool that has an interface um, and everything like that. And then I also oversee our global experience monitoring uh, benchmarking tool, which uh, initially really focused in on payment gateways and benchmarking from a technology perspective, from an experience perspective, as well as a developer perspective, which we're going to get into a little bit more uh, later today. And then also um, e-reports, which is a continuation of our thought leadership. You know, we're really um, also focused in on directories that we're putting together in the merchant acquiring space, gateway directories, as well as additional thought leadership around buy now, pay later, surcharging, uh, embedded finance, <laughs> to name a few, uh, QSR and payments, for example. And then um, last but definitely not least is our consulting services. And th think of this as kind of a, a bullpen of industry experts, all with a, a very specific focus. These industry experts have decades of experience, so real hands-on live application. And so with that bullpen of experienced senior associates, along with our market intelligence, along with our analytics platforms, we're really able to offer the payments industry something, something very unique to solve uh, the problems. And our, our vision statement here is provide clarity to the complex. And that's what we set out to do. Yeah, obviously a well well respected uh, name uh, in in industry for sure, and uh, a lot of great products and reports coming out of your camp, which is really cool to see. Um, as we're seeing kind of some of those benefits, as you look at the payment industry itself um, and outside, obviously finance in general and broader uh, aspects of it, what you know, greater benefits would you see both inside and outside the industry from that perspective that, that that's being provided? I know you, you highlighted what the products, how they touch mm -hmm. those things, but in a, in a more more direct form, and we'll get into an article uh, that, that came out recently uh, that we could begin to reference, understanding the buzz around embedded as an example. Mm -hmm. and, and why I bring that up is, you know, we have been talking a lot about embedded and we are an embedded player in, in payments specifically, not overarching finance. And just a couple of podcasts ago, we we're talking to Mark Bishop here and talking to him about what's the difference kind of between embedded and integrated mm -hmm. and what the evolution is and what what does it mean? And I think we're on the same wavelength uh, reading your mm -hmm. your uh, uh, report that came out, your article that came out. We felt I was like, all right got to talk to Josh here because there's some some uh, like mindedness and and let's have a little bit of fun with this so yeah absolutely um so we're servicing not only really start kind of the merchant acquirer experience the processor experience and helping them out uh, with their needs and ultimately we're about 
helping the customer, the customer's customer, the customer's customer, customer. You keep going down the pipeline, if you will. So we're starting with uh, working with processors, helping their acquiring relationships, the acquiring relationship, helping their customers, which would be the merchants themselves and the merchants themselves, then um, focusing on their consumers and facilitating sure. that payment. Because really, you know, if you, th- you want to break payments down, it's, it's, it's about volume. How are we there's still the big conversion of check cash to card. And I mean, we're down to about 20% or so uh, of cash being consumer spending that's left there to, <laughs> to convert, if you will. And so we're trying to help facilitate that all the way. Then you want to go from the ground up consumer. How, how are we able to help make that experience fr- more frictionless or at least inform merchants and acquirers of our insights and what do we think about that and then from the the merchant experience you know how can they work with their customers and then work with their acquirers so really it's kind of an up and down and we're trying to really focus in and help clarify that whole process that flow and then ultimately go back to my point of increasing you know volume payments volume throughout the industry yeah and it's is is it you know this idea you mentioned cash shift the 20 percent number we've obviously seen a shift with not just cash business also checks and paper and Mm -hmm. going over to more of this ach easy bank transfers the threat of what um you know i think it was elon musk and x talking about this idea that you know you don't even need a bank in in the future and that's something they're striving to to shift um you are you seeing you know is it the end of the world for cash, so to speak, is this like where we're headed? Uh, like not to be, you know, in this place of like, oh, that would never happen. At one point in time, there was gold that was exchanged, yeah. like literally like silver and gold and metals and things like that. And then, you know, cash has been a thing for a very long time. Well, you know, does embedded in this thing, this new term that's coming out, is that what is the knockout punch for cash altogether, like the embedded finance industry in general and embedding into APIs and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing that as a thing? Yeah, I'm not sure if it'll be the the knockout blow, but definitely moving away. Cause so let's let's think about there's not just in the in the US, let's go broader than that. There's still, you know, a technology void a little bit. So there's still going to be some physical uh, payments and transactions in that way. And then I also kind of think about the uh, B2B space. You know, there's still a lot of that driven by ACH check, uh, not so much cash, but ACH and check. I think there's always going to be a little bit of um, remaining, you know, residual, (laughs) we'll just say cash and check that will never quite get converted. Um, but we'll get, we'll get pretty darn close. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like there is this need. I was actually saying how, um, watching my children try to handle cash is, is pretty funny to see. Um, not exactly understanding like some, some exchange of what this is and how this all works and how many folks aren't even carrying it at all. The watch, you know, the, the the phone, you know, Apple Pay, so on and so forth. So it's, it's really interesting to see how this continues to uh, uh, transcend. Mm-hmm. When we think about now this article that was written, understanding the buzz around embedded, um, it's really an interesting word or term. And, you know, we've watched it transition quite a bit in, in my 20 plus years in industry, right? We know that us as an industry is an example, we're just merchant services providers. People are like, oh, you sell credit card payments, right? Yeah. To, to businesses, right? Uh, you, you're, you do merchant services. That was kind of the term. Oh. And then it becomes more about acquiring in general. And then it became uh, uh, ISV focused a, as we see. Mm-hmm. So talking a little bit about those nuances and what you saw versus what it is and then what it's becoming would be great to hear from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So when I started in payments, there was the assumption of that payments was just a commodity, right? It was just the race to the bottom. That's where we're going. But, you know, as consumers and merchants started to demand a little bit more. So let's think about, you know, ISVs. Merchants, we'll go back to our golf course example. Uh, a golf course wants to manage, you know, uh, reservations, the snack bar, tea times, everything like that, the, the, uh, the driving range. They're going to pick out a specific software to help them manage that. Well, I'm relying on that software as that golf course, and I also have to accept payments. So I'm the one that's saying, you know, it would be really convenient for me 
to have payments acceptance directly within my software. And that's that ISD payments monetization play. Well, that's really driven by the merchant, by the business, by their requirements. Whereas it's not just, you know, I want to accept payments is I want that to be facilitated in, into something that I can't live without. So that that merchant itself is really driving that acceptance within the ISV. And now we're, we're going a little bit further down that chain where now we're talking about the consumer themselves and how do they live? How do they work in integrating embedding payments into their lifestyle, into what kind of applications and interfaces are they using? So now we've gone one, lo one level down further getting to that consumer level. Yeah, absolutely. To your to your example of the golf course, there's a why that comes behind a lot of these from the consumer perspective that we actually recently launched our white paper on embedded, similar to what you had put out with this idea of what is it, you know, debunking what it is and isn't and understanding all the aspects of embedded. Um, and when we started to look at those things, you sort of say, okay, well, when I am on the golf course and the cart comes around and I want a snack. And the only mm -hmm. thing they accept is cash and you don't have cash. Does that now limit your ability to purchase a drink or buy a snack or whatever the case may be? And as the experience gets more powerful and how I would love to describe it is this idea of this invisible experience that as the consumer, it is frictionless. It is mm -hmm. this idea that I can actually order frictionless through the ISV, through the software order have what I want on demand, get to my location quicker and not have to have an exchange. And we're seeing a lot yeah. of that occur, like less exchange, less reason for exchange in the hotel space. That's, that's the space my family's from originally. Like, you know, do you actually need to check in at a, at a front desk like this? And we're seeing like, oh, you can quote unquote check in on the app now, right? And, and all mm. of these things I think would be part of kind of the embedded experience, but then we carve out the financial part and then furthermore yeah. drill down to the payment part of embedded, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, also fairly complex for people, thus why we created a white paper. <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So we think we think about Im embedded finance and this is what we're talking about. These terms, embedded finance, embedded payments, they're often used in synonymously, which they they are not. Um, and embedded finance is in, in embedding financial tools into a non finance interface or application. Right. But embedded finance is an over uh, encompassing umbrella of embedded payments. It includes embedded insurance. It includes embedded uh, banking, for example, as well as embedded lending. And so not only are we um, embedding the ease of uh, accepting or, or making payments within a non-payments or non-financial application or interface, but there's also opportunities for you know, embedded insurance. So you go to Ticketmaster, uh, you buy your next event. Uh, I recently bought tickets to uh, Blink-182. They're coming back around with their U.S. tour, right. and I bought some insurance with that because that's not for, you know, next August, I think, is when that show is. So I bought some insurance there. Uh, embedded banking, uh, allowing, allowing you to um, access bank, banking where you may not have been able to in the past. Um, as well as embedded lending. Buy now, pay later, for example, is an example of uh, embedded lending. So embedded finance is a lot more uh, than just embedded embedded payments. Yeah. And is it like, is there an argument to be made that if I just said to you, they're all just integrated? Uh, they're just all integrated. Those are all, you know, buy now, pay later is integrated. Uh, the banking is just integrated, right? Is it a playoff wars? Is it just attractive to have a new term that came out because the old one, it wasn't as, you know, a, a tr you know, sexy, if you will, like what's kind of the feeling as to why the word embedded? Yeah. And em embedded um, in my content is just easier, to, is easier to use, easier to integrate, especially from a developer's perspective. It doesn't, it doesn't require as much of a, a hands-on experience integrating into a specific software. It's also more universal in nature. Um, it is a very attractive word as well. So I won't downplay that, <laughs> but it, it, it does differentiate itself from a, just an integrated type of payment. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And we've noticed that as well. If you go to our site, as an example, the, the term embedded is front and center because mm -hmm. there is this understanding that folks are gaining as to like what the gaps are. Yes, there are integrations that still occur, Yeah, but mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in, in agreement there with you on, on that part, as you're seeing that the state of 
embedded payments, finance, and then payments, the payment part mm -hmm. of it specifically, where are you seeing it in the evolution at this stage? Like, would you say we are, you know, 40% to critical mass, 20%, 50%, 75% kind of, is there a gauge as to what penetration from an embedded perspective, uh, uh, is, is, um, in market now? You know, without using a specific percentage, I'll, I'll maybe counter that with a little bit of where there may be opportunities still. And so we sure. think about the Internet of Things and, you know, we're connected all the time with our watches, with our with our ovens and ranges and refrigerators and everything. So every interaction point is a point of opportunity and that point of opportunity presents an opportunity for a payment. You know, now you can go into your, your fridge and say, well, I'm out of apples. I want to put it in order to the grocery store and get some apples. So my point being there, those points of interaction that we have also represent an opportunity for payments. So there's a lot more to explore there. Um, just our daily lives are, are inundated with connection points. So why couldn't all those connection points be an uh, opportunity for payments? Yeah, and it really does feel like just the tip of the iceberg, like it's just the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Although some people are like, ah, it's late or no, it's, it's actually fairly young. I mean, when you really think about the evolution of the industry itself, you know, here in the United States, we didn't have chip and pin until 2015 oh, yeah. decades past Europe. I mean, you know, they were, I believe 1994 is when it may mm -hmm. have been introduced in France uh, or parts of Europe. And here we are in 2015, finally introducing it. So I think, you know, there's a long and, and, and interesting story that we're going to see. And it, I think it's fun for us to be at this stage of the uh, payment ecosystem in general to see how we maneuver. And, and what's also cool is being able to help guide that story and craft yeah. the story because we all do have a part in it um, mm -hmm. uh, today, which is which is super cool. So what considerations would developers and should developers be thinking about from a strategic perspective when they're looking at, you know, the embedded industries and, and, and payments? Yeah, so developers are going to, it's a unique, it's a unique breed, it's a unique perspective. You know, first of all, there's going to be the functionality requirements, as well as the, the simple kind of cost considerations. And, and once you get past that, we're really getting into what's important to developers is going to be the, the data security piece, right? Um, so everything in the future, and you know, right now, it really needs to start being driven by a token, which already started that, but that has to eventually just come full circle, because the, uh, the PANs, you know, that most of the frauds can be coming from the swipe. Uh, that's where you're going to get that. So from a security perspective, developers really need to be focused on that. And then also, you know, there's a big ease of use. And I, I can go very far into this. Um, portability is one of them. You know, is there a, a white label offering or is it exclusive to a sponsored type of solution? And then ultimately from the developer's experience, it's how easy is it to use? A lot of developers are... They don't work the nine to five like you and I may. They may work off hours. They want to be self-sufficient. So documentation is going to be key for them, along with the functionality, security, portability. So all of these considerations. And, and this goes back to, you know, who is driving the requirements? It was the merchants. It was, you know, using ISVs, for example. Now it's consumers using applications and interfaces. And to make that easier, we need to make it easier for developers as well. And that includes the documentation uh, and how we can, you know, review that, interpret it and um, be self-sufficient. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the the conversation as well around the self-sufficiency is an interesting one because Apple is a great example that I love to use that took an amazing technology that is self-sufficient, but then also added amazing retail experiences and educational experiences in person that allow you to kind of have the best of both worlds, because as we know, you know, most developers are not payment experts and they mm -hmm. may think they know what they may know, but now they're only relying on developer documentation as well. Do you mm -hmm. think there's this attractive balance as well that, you know, I think Apple has nailed or some others of like, look, you know, we need to have an amazing tech stack. We need to have an amazing embedded experience. Right. But also mm -hmm. in addition to that, human beings still matter. There are some models that have totally gotten away from it. And I think there's definitely a place in the market for it. But philosophically, I think that 
the people do matter and the people you're talking to and the people on your team to have mm -hmm. those conversations? Is that something that you also put some stock in the ability to have those types of architectural conversations? Where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? And having that uh, guided experience, as we like to call it here. Yeah. And I think that could take place in, in two ways. There's the direct interfacing with a guided experience of a one-on-one -on -one consultation or with a team. And then there's also providing a seamless user experience with within the documentation of, you know, how would I use this um, idea generation in that way where that's still self-discovery, but you're actually implementing, embedding, if I, if I may, uh, instructions and use cases for that uh, specific application. So I do feel um, that there are different consumers out there. In this case, we're talking about developers as the uh, consumer, where some want it frictionless. I really don't want to interact with anyone at all. And then there's some that actually enjoy that or would prefer that. And I think that still exists within uh, merchant acceptance. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting too. You start to think about all the different ways people take in information, right? I mean, one point in time, there was, you know, we watched TV, and mm -hmm. HBO, I still remember when it came out, uh, you know, kind of dating myself here and like the amount of channels we had at my grandparents' house and the remote control that was, you know, on a wire attached to the TV on an old Zenith, I believe was the model of that, that, that TV. And what you started to see was there was kind of one way to take an information or two, right? You had the newspaper and you had the TV possibly, and mm -hmm. those are kind of their two ways. And now there's so many different flavors, right? I mean, social media is a great example. When we go to post something, it's not like, oh, we're just posting on Facebook. Right. It's like, you know, some people love to be on Facebook. Others love to be on, uh, you know, Instagram, you have all these different flavors and, and versions of that. And I think to your point, it's so important that we do understand that there is not this one silver bullet, that there is a hybrid mm. approach to a lot of these different experiences. And with that being said, one of the things that I think is also this challenge is as folks are developing, they're developing for today based on the tech st stack that might be there in the payment ecosystem today, not fully mm -hmm. considering what we, what might be coming tomorrow. Uh, I had mentioned on a previous uh, episode, the, you know, whole foods palm experience now with Amazon paying, you know, you're paying with your palm. It's like a crazy yeah, biometric. Yeah. The mm -hmm. biometric experience of what that's going to be in the future and how that affects embedded payments and the developer decision is really interesting. What those roadmaps look like. And we've advised as an example from a developer perspective and software owner and, mm -hmm. you know, the ISV world, what are consumers looking for as we continue to move into the future and what are those roadmaps look for? So one of the questions that I think is a, a wise one for developers or software providers to ask, or even the, the the business owner that's looking for a software is what does that roadmap look like? Any other like questions that you feel are 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 important to the developer community, the ISV community, so on and so forth that they should be asking when considering their model. You know, from a developer experience. Um, I think the guidance that we can provide in we talked about the documentation I itself, but there the applications are going to be coming once again from the consumer. And so what I really like to think of from a user experience, where are we going is get a pulse, get a read on what the consumer actually wants. Because with our experience here, my experience with product development and product strategy is we've created, invented, developed all cool features, functionalities that we think the market needs and wants. You don't really know that until, until you really get that uh, approach to the market, the user experience. And so understanding in advance of how consumers are going to be using what their preferences are. So my, the big example or one of the big examples is the early onset of the pandemic. Obviously, you know, cash and kind of, there's more concerns there with things spreading and which ultimately relate to the adoption or, or greater adoption of NFC, you know, the tap transaction, if yeah. you will. So that expedited that. But there was a lot of hesitancy. There's still security hesitancy from consumers. And so really getting ahead of that, you know. Getting a pulse on merchants, getting a pulse on consumers, doing, you know, we do a lot of, uh, we're going to be releasing some holiday spending results here uh, coming up, for example. But I don't have the, you know, 
the future. I don't have that storytelling <laughs> book that I can get into, uh, but really trying to understand the the future user experience through direct you know, kind of surveys. And, and one thing I always think of is, you know, how can we collect information? You know, there are POS terminals, let's say, even a soft POS that's on your phone. You know, can we continue to collect information with the quick questions? Not just are you satisfied, you know, with the app, but are there things that we can, we can uh, get directly from the consumer, from the user, data collection in that way, and then leverage that within our product roadmaps, within our product directions? Those points of interaction, that feedback that we can get directly from consumers are really going to drive everything. And so the more creative we can get to get that feedback will help drive developers, products, softwares in order to either advance consumer adoption quicker or maybe redirect. Maybe, maybe we're not going down the right road. Maybe we're trying to push too hard from top down, whereas the consumer actually wants to, once again, just like using softwares, ISVs, I would prefer to have my payments in there, but I'm not going to go away from my vendor, just like me using an application. I really love my app that I'm using right now. I'd prefer just to live in it. That's consumers driving that. So the more we can get that feedback and tighten up those feedback loops, the more we can inform that developer roadmap. Yeah. And it sounds like, oh, you know, listening to the customer, right? Listening to the consumer. And, and, and oftentimes I feel like it's, it's um, forgotten, although when stated, it's like, it's, it's, yes, that's exactly what you should be doing. And yet people get into their own heads of what they believe the consumer wants, or they believe they can control the habits of the mm -hmm. consumers. But that's, that's a, that's a really great point. Yeah, Cause uh, if we, if we think about it, we're, you know, we're trying to do that. We're talking about embedded, we're talking about a, a frictionless experience, right? Right. Um, I recently was trying to, you know, book a, a, a hair appointment and I got to a point where I was able to schedule it and I wasn't able to pay for it. Guess what that did? I had to stop right there. I walked away and I said that point of friction actually just turned me right off. So <laughs> oh, having that, that's just one user example of that experience to try to avoid any level of friction. But also that's my, that's me being a consumer saying, I want to do this. I want to book online. I want to pay through my application. And, and I think as, as consumers, it's interesting when you compare the consumer who also is a business owner and a lot of, right. I mean, mm -hmm. and I've absolutely, case, we are consumers yeah. and we're business owners, that very thing that they want for themselves, they often forget for their own business when they're asking the questions to their software of, Hey, what capabilities do you have? Something you mentioned the salon business as an example, like the recurring model doesn't affect, like doesn't hit particular industries as quickly as others. And the hotel business is an example. In restaurant business, credit card acceptance has been around for a really long time, while in healthcare, there's some real delays where even mm -hmm. in some healthcare, they're still using a fax phone number to send mm -hmm. information, a fax. I, I couldn't believe it when I heard this, by the way. And I'm like, wait, what just happened here, right? And I, I, I was like, I just automatically imagined the fax that had like the rolling paper that was yeah. like that. Like, yeah, I was like, what, what, is, what is happening? So you see that and you say, okay, well, what would I want for myself? And then I want that for my customer as well. So if it's a salon, why do I ever have to make a payment at the counter of a salon? If I'm right. constantly engaging with the same barber or stylist every single time I come in. And what if I want to just add those two products? Now I got to pull my credit card out. Like, why can't you just mm -hmm. charge my card on file? Or why can't you just have me stored in there? And, and some of the debates are, well, people don't feel safe. People feel safe enough when they know that the technology that's being used and the name behind it are securing it because we're comfortable with our cell phone bill with AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile mm -hmm. going out every month. We're comfortable with our mortgage or our rent going out every month in the recurring model. We should also be comfortable, especially in the relationship-based processing segment, a lot of room uh, uh, to move based on listening to the consumer. So mm -hmm. absolutely, I totally in alignment with you in agreement there. Yeah. So what I what I was thinking on that one as you were you were speaking was it goes back to the developer and the security, the importance of security there, right? Because we have to have a trust between the consumer and just the the industry in, in general. Because you have, like you said earlier on, if you have your cash, I trust that that's you know worth something. There is a sense of security there in a in a way of I exchange it to you. There's not there's no personal information involved there. But then that, that goes back to the tokenization. That goes back to the non swiping. So it's actually more secure to have that account on file and have those tokenized transactions. But does the consumer always know that 
no, not necessarily. So there's a level of education there that can be provided to expedite that level of adoption um, that really could, you know, take off the um, the account, uh, card on file kind of uh, process. Oh, the, the bank, the bank account itself. Like, oh, I don't, I don't want to store my bank account on file as an example. Yeah. It sounds scary. But somebody gets a hold of a check. It's your signature on it. It's your address on yeah. it. It's like it's got all this personal information in the yeah. banking industry. And security is went to great lengths to even if somebody's bank account is hacked, they protect the consumer from something devastating happening uh, from that experience. So I think you're right. It is a lot of education that goes behind. Nope, this is actually safer or at least mm -hmm. even playing field of somebody stealing a checkbook and going around and sort of writing checks, which was a common thing yeah. uh, back in and the day. And that goes, there's that distribution channel, right? So we're, we're trying to uh, encourage payments and there's a level of trust there. There's also the level of education with the consumer, but that also starts with the merchant themselves. You know, yeah. can I accept this? What what do I know about payments? So there's that. And then that kind of goes back to your point uh, earlier when we were talking about, you know, developer experience. Is there that interaction with the merchant to educate them? Or is there instructions provided to help um, educate them without the you know intera human interaction, more of a tech touch way? You know, different consumers for different methods. Either way, what we're trying to do is accomplish um, a knowledge and education of those merchants ultimately to to the consumers, ultimately driving more card acceptance and more volume. So you can see how everything just flows together nicely. And we're all trying to accomplish, you know, in this industry, really the same objective of just increased volume. So that's what we're, yeah. we're trying to accomplish exactly. here. Exactly right. And with, with that being said, predictions from TSG's perspective, from Josh's perspective here on 2024 in the world of payments. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to consider. Um, I have already touched on a few. I have touched on the Internet of Things. That was something, those points of interaction, which represents uh, opportunities for us. I think soft pause is something that will, you know, really, it'll be here for a very long time. So that's getting rid of any need for a specific hardware. That means any NFC enab enabled device. That's your phone. Most pretty much any smartphone can be able to accept transactions through a tap or NFC transaction. I think that's that's huge. That's the democratization of accepting payments, if you will, from an actual card. And then there's also, you know, some other other movement uh, enablement of movement of money from the account to account uh, type of payments there, uh, which I think is going to continue to move forward. Um, and then obviously the, the embedded nature and the functionality, uh, driving things. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Josh, that's really great. I've, I've enjoyed speaking, speaking with you today for sure. I do have one more question. Is there a podcast, a book, a show? What is, what's Josh, uh, uh suggesting somebody, uh, listen to or read or, or watch and, and <laughs> what's your flavor? It, it may not be everybody's cup of tea, but you started off with the introduction, right? It's the convergence of sports and analy analytics. It's where those intersect. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, fantasy sports podcasts. Uh, specifically, one of, my, one of my favorites to listen to is uh, the GM, if you will, Jim Boat, who uh, <laughs> very entertaining, very knowledgeable about baseball. Actually, it's kind of like a, a TSG here. We have the hands-on experience, has the hands-on experience to describe what he's seeing behind the lens and then uh you know i love statistics and i love their application and love games <laughs> those all come together and it all comes together in that case for my uh my fantasy sports podcast awesome josh thank you so much for the time today it's been a lot of fun talking to you and looking forward to seeing all the work and uh uh make sure y'all read uh the understanding the buzz around embedded um with uh, from tsg Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Jimmy. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Well, let's go over the three takeaways from this podcast. Number one, payments are no longer just a commodity. And while merchants were driving features for ISVs and developers, the consumer is now the one demanding the types of features and functionality. And what's more, the new benchmark is expecting the seamlessness from the standard players to be available with all software vendors. Number two, while players in the financial space need to focus on their unique features and cost for the consumer, the payments partner should focus on the ease of use in their integration documentation. And number three, get a pulse on what the consumer actually wants. 
It's all too common to believe that the features that you're building are what the consumer wants. However, you'll see that if it wasn't vetted properly, you may not get consumer adoption that you're expecting. The key is to survey your audience beyond the satisfaction ratings by analyzing the data points that tell the true consumer story. Well, that's the episode of Embedded. If you found value in this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and subscribe to stay up to date on payments, software, and emerging technologies.